Hi everyone, Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton here with our weekly update on social media. Thank you as always for joining us this week. Uh, a lot going on as always when it comes to government corruption in Washington, D.C. Uh, whether Congress is in session, out of session, no matter what's happening, you can be sure there's always a little bit of government corruption happening. And I'll give you an update on the abusive sham trial of President Trump up in New York, how that as uh, that trial seems to be getting just worse and worse in terms of being exposed as a corrupt failure. Uh, we have new documents about illegal alien voting here in Washington, D.C. You're going to be shocked and outraged by it. By it. Uh, plus, Joe Biden is, doesn't want you to hear something he, something he said or told the Justice Department. I'll talk to you about that extraordinary Nixonian uh, uh, assertion of executive privilege Plus, a little bit of justice, a little bit of vindication, uh, Fauci's agency, their grants are being shut off uh, to the gain of function research operations that have been funded for years, uh, some of which people are concerned about may have led to the creation of COVID. Uh, so there's a lot going on. Uh, Judicial Watch, of course, is front and center in virtually all of it. Uh, first up, let's give you an update on the fifth week of, as I've called it, America Held Hostage, where the Democratic judge up there, Judge Merchant, is keeping President Trump hostage, a personal, a political hostage in his courtroom as he goes through this abusive trial uh, brought by Alvin Bragg, the Soros-backed prosecutor, Democratic politician. Now, previously, I kept on saying Merchant is a Democratic politician because he's been elected. He wasn't elected. He was selected. Some judges up in New York are selected. Merchant is one of them, but Merchant is a Democrat operative in the sense, or activist in the sense that he gives money to the Biden campaign. He gave money to other far left uh, anti-Trump and anti-conservative Democratic groups. And on top of that, his daughter uh, as further compromise his ability to fair, uh, serve fairly on this, uh, on this trial uh, by taking money from anti-Trumpers in a way that shows that uh, she benefits financially from uh, this trial. So no matter how you slice it, Judge Merchant shouldn't be the judge on this case. So it's been abuse on top of abuse for Trump. He's obviously been subject, as we've complained about, a gag order, an anti-constitutional gag order that serves to constrain him from defending himself and campaigning at the same time. Uh, so his, can't, his campaign can't talk, and he can't talk about key issues related to this case. So Stormy Daniels can essentially call him all these terrible names uh, for no good end in front of the jury, and he can't defend himself by going back at her. Similarly, Michael Cohen, his lying criminal ex-lawyer, can make all sorts of fake allegations against him and he can't respond and, and uh, criticize him because of this gag order. So all these headlines are out there, and Judge Merchant is essentially uh, is controlling the Trump campaign. Now, do you recall by allowing or agreeing to allow a Democrat appointed judge up in New York, a Biden donor, to run our presidential election? Well, that's essentially what's happening. And the Cohen uh, case shows uh, that, uh, or the Cohen testimony shows, that there's no there there when it comes to this prosecution. It really exposes the corruption associated with this prosecution. Uh, Cohen confirmed in his testimony that he's a liar. Uh, his, his testimony was, uh, in fact, uh, Trump's lawyer said he was lying right then and there to the jury. And on top of that, uh, it's clear from his testimony that this idea to pay off Stormy Daniels or to give her a confidentiality, uh, a fee in consideration for confidentiality in a non-disclosure agreement, all of that was run by, uh, run by Cohen. You know, and Trump, you know, in the end, paid him his legal expenses as Trump understood them to take care of the expenses that Cohen made on his own. So if you believe Cohen, there's no crime. And of course, if he's lying, it makes it 
<laughs> even less credible that he can be relied upon to accuse Trump of anything. And, you know, as I've tweeted, and I'll show you the tweet here, I, I'm still waiting. It's been now the main witness, Cohen, has testified, still waiting for any evidence of criminal activity by Trump in that sham trial up in New York. In fact, it looks like to me that Cohen should be on the dock. He recorded Trump. He uh, uh, admitted to lying beyond what he's already admitted to in other jurisdictions and in other, in other, in other forums. And as Trump's lawyer said, he's arguably lying right now. And I don't know how the jury's going to take all of this because Cohen's credibility, it seems to me, was completely gutted by Trump's attorneys. And even the prosecution really didn't get much in the way of good evidence from him. Not a credible witness in my, my view. But I don't know what the jury's going to do. Uh, next week, uh, there may be a witness or two that Trump brings in. And then it goes to the jury. I mean, the jury is going to get this next week, as based on my understanding of the process up there in New York City. But in the meantime, the country suffers. And, you know, I highlighted that it puts, makes America look bad. And, you know, Trump uh, has been following Judicial Watch and my comments on these areas, and he's been... Uh, referencing some of our, our, uh, our commentary and analysis of the uh, outrageous predicament he's in. Let's go to those tapes. Tom Fitton, the Biden Democratic Party sham and the sham trial and other abuses of Trump are an international scandal that harms America and it really does, it really harms America. It's from Tom Fitton. Yeah, this is the tweet he's referencing. The world is watching the Biden Democratic Party sham trial and other abuses of Trump are international scandal that harms America. Our country's reputation as a shining city on the hill. Remember that biblical quotation that Ronald Reagan used so effectively is tarnished by this political persecution of Trump. Now the whole world sees our system as no better than a banana republic. I think it endangers our national security and our national standing. And Trump referenced another uh, comment I made about this sham proceeding earlier this week as well. And he Tom Fitton, uh, I've carefully tracked the at real Donald Trump trial up in New York. The prosecution, in quotes, prosecution, meaning persecution, hasn't presented any evidence of a crime by Trump whatsoever. Judge Mershon is... Uh, well, he says very negative things about him. I don't want to say that about the judge. I'm not going to say that today about the judge. Judge Mershon, at the conclusion of the prosecution's case, this is the part, this is the part Trump didn't read, should follow the law and send the trial or end the trial with a directed verdict for Trump's acquittal. There's no basis for a jury to find Trump guilty of anything. There's no evidence that's been presented. And if Judge Merchant, as a judge, allows us to go to a jury, in my view, that would be just another abuse of Trump. It would be another abuse of Trump. There's no way a jury has enough evidence to find President Trump guilty of any crime, let alone the fake crimes that are being alleged here. And it bears repeating, because you won't hear this in the media, he's being accused of falsifying business records in advance of another crime because they had to make that conditional. Otherwise, the case would have been thrown out for statute of limitations issues because those issues about falsifying business records, uh, the statute of limitations, uh, it goes back years and years. It's already passed it. Arguably, the federal, any, any other crimes um, are past statute of limitations as well, but that's another argument. And the outrage is, they still haven't told Trump or the American people or the jury what those other crimes are. It can't be a federal election crime. They don't have jurisdiction over federal election law up in New York. So what, what is it? And thankfully, uh, members of Congress who are concerned about the rule of law have started taking my advice. We've been talking publicly about this, right? Why aren't the Republicans out there 
standing with and defending Trump. And to his credit, as I noted, Speaker Johnson was up in New York. He went up there, I guess, on Tuesday. Was it Tuesday? I think so. And I said, I thanked him. You know, I criticize Speaker Johnson all the time here, so I'm going to praise him here. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, for going up to New York to stand with Trump, the rule of law, and the U.S. Constitution. You are right. It is a brazen and unprecedented election interference. And we have a clip of the Speaker's comments after his um, uh, quit a brief attendance at Trump's trial to show his. I'm an attorney. I'm a former litigator myself. I am disgusted by what is happening here. What is being done here to our entire system of justice overall? The people are losing faith right now in this country, in our institutions. They're losing faith in our system of justice. And the reason for that is because they see it being abused as it is being done here in New York. The facts here are very important. Facts are always important in a trial, or at least they're supposed to be. The president's actions in this matter were previously reviewed and no charges were filed. Why is that? Because there's no crime here. And the Alabama attorney general is up that way as well. 30 years I have been a prosecutor and cared desperately about what goes on in our criminal justice system. And I have never seen in my career a greater perversion of the criminal justice system than I witnessed this morning. We had more questions about Michael Cohen's feelings than we did connecting him to any criminal offense. When I was a district attorney, I had the privilege of being able to work with Cy Vance. I know that his team reviewed these facts and rejected any effort to use the resources of this city to pursue a sham prosecution. Now, you saw behind um, the attorney general there, Congress or Senators J.D. Vance and, and uh, Coach Tuberville, and there were some members of Congress up there. Byron Donalds went up there. I know Gates was up there and a few others. I, I, good for them. I, good for them. And uh, in the meantime, uh, while Trump is being harassed for non-crimes, Biden is escaping accountability or trying to escape accountability uh, related to his involvement in what his own Justice Department considered to be through the special counsel on lawful activity that they decided not to prosecute because he, quote, has no memory. And uh, one of those big issues as it relates to that investigation is getting the audio tapes of his communication or his interviews with the special counsel. He interviewed uh, special counsel Her in investigating Biden's illicit uh, mishandling of classified information, including information from his days as a senator. I mean, he had no, no legal defense for that. Uh, that, uh, you know, these interviews are a big deal because her concluded, so he says, that Biden had no memory and no jury's ever going to convict him. And Biden said, oh, no, that's not true. So the transcript was released. We've sued for these records. We want the transcript and any audio or video. And now the issue is about the audio. Now, we, as I've told you last week, we, are, we already are in federal court with a FOIA lawsuit for the audio. The Biden Justice Department has told us outrageously that uh, we can't get it because the video, the audio uh, would uh, release of it would violate Joe Biden's privacy his privacy. It's absurd. He's president of the United States. The transcript's been released. He doesn't have a privacy interest here in any stretch of the, any, any, any measure of the word that would outweigh the public interest in gaining access to this information. He was interviewed by a special counsel of his Justice Department in a, in a criminal investigation of him. But then it, get, then it got worse because Congress has already is, has also been seeking the documents. And so they've um, subpoenaed Attorney General Garland and Garland's ignored the subpoena. Now, of course, there, the Congress is asking for a lot more than what Judicial Watch is at least suing in this case for, in addition to the audio. But the audio obviously is something that everyone wants to see because that's going to help uh, a confirm whether or not the Justice Department took the right step in declining to prosecute Biden and whether he's fit for the presidency. I mean, two very important issues. And rather than turn the audio over and other records over, uh, 
Garland got Biden to assert executive privilege over these records, including his audio of the interviews. And in some ways, well, I shouldn't say, in a central way, it was designed to prevent Garland from being found in contempt of Congress for re refusing to turn over the information in response to Congress's lawful subpoena. Now, the committee voted him out in contempt, the Judiciary Committee. I'm not sure what the House is going to do. I mean, the challenge for the House is that uh, Garland's uh, contempt, if it's to be prosecuted, would be prosecuted by Garland, right? Or Garland's Justice Department. So you know how that's going to work. And the other thing is that there was a civil uh, avenue that they can pursue via contempt. And we know how that's going to go in terms of time. And I kind of analyzed a little bit of this on Twitter. Um, let's throw a few of those tweets up. You know, we have 30 years experience fighting these records issues in court at the highest levels of our government, the White House. And I can tell you, and I say we're curious how executive privilege could possibly apply to these tapes, and we're going to probably be litigating the use of this executive privilege, a novel, unprecedented application of it in court. But, you know, let's be clear. They don't want those audio tapes coming out because Biden clearly has something to hide. The willingness of Attorney General Garland to go into contempt suggests that, as I say, there are substantial political issues in the audio tapes. One question that presents itself now is, is whether the release transcript is fully accurate. Maybe, maybe we, we are wrong to presume that the transcript provides an accurate picture of what went on. And I can tell you, audio sometimes has material in there that isn't picked up at the transcript level. And again, we're the ones doing the heavy lifting in court right now. Now, Heritage Foundation followed up with us. They sued. And CNN and a bunch of other media organizations have also sued. Uh, but this issue is joined right now by Judicial Watch in federal court. Currently, the Justice Department is under court order to respond to uh, and defend their reasons to withhold the information in our FOIA case in the next two weeks. It's going to be due two weeks from now, on May 31st. And in the meantime, Garland's set to join Obama's corrupt attorney general, Eric Holder, in the history books as being, I guess, one of the, one of the two attorney generals found in contempt of Congress. And I talked about this a little bit in a, in a video we did summarizing this material earlier this week. Hey everyone, Joe Biden is so desperate to keep those audio tapes of his special counsel interviews away from you and from Congress that he is asserting executive privilege in a way that's never been done before in American history. And of course, it's also designed to protect Attorney General Garland, who seems so intent on hiding these audio tapes that he's willing to go into contempt of Congress, joining Barack Obama's Attorney General Eric Holder as the only Attorney General found in contempt of Congress. I tell you, Judicial Watch is already now in federal court suing for these audio tapes uh, they have asserted privacy exemptions to hide the records from us. They're trying to protect Joe Biden's privacy. Now, on top of that, now they're asserting executive privilege. We've never seen anything like it before. The tapes must be devastating. Now, Judicial Watch is going to pursue this issue in federal court. Frankly, I think we'll get the audio tapes before Congress does at this rate. Uh, but we're here fighting for you, the American people, as Joe Biden tries to cover up his corruption. You know, I love doing videos like that. You know why? Because so few people go out and talk about these issues in a direct way, uh, and, and Judicial Watch has got this unique perspective and experience that no one else has, and it drives the left crazy because we've got such a broad reach, so we put these videos out and they go ballistic, and they really go ballistic because they don't know what to say because we know what we're talking about. So of course they just engage in ad hominem attacks. As I as I said, they 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 get distracted by my looks and the fact that I'm not law, I'm not a lawyer. It just that, that's how sad it is. They they can't respond specifically to these big issues. 
And so with your support, we're able to, through this video and our other social media activity, educate Americans that are never gonna hear this analysis from uh, the media, even, even friendly media. They got more constraints than we do in terms of time and the ability to communicate this as, as substantially as we're able to do. You know, and one thing that hasn't been talked about, hasn't been talked about, and we've talked about it previously here, is that the contempt authority to Congress doesn't and shouldn't rely on the Justice Department to enforce it. That's been the practice in the last, you know, 40 or 50 years, but constitutionally speaking, and there's been, goes back to the beginning of our, our nation's founding, Congress has inherent contempt authority and can enforce it directly. So yes, Congress, if they wanted to, the House could uh, find Bar Garland in contempt and arrest him and keep him imprisoned until the contempt is cured, meaning they get the documents and the audio they want. So that's a test for <laughs> that. Mike Johnson, the speaker, isn't probably want to have to, isn't going to want to have to go through, but that's another option out there. It's it doesn't have to just fi have a contempt motion passed by the House and it essentially dies because con the the uh, contempt is only pursued against the Republicans. Peter Navarro's in jail right now for it. They're trying to jail Bannon right now on it, or pursue a slow civil process through an, a, a direct lawsuit. As best I can tell, they haven't even figured out what they're gonna do in that regard. And as I noted in the video, uh, we're likely to get the audio prior to Congress. I mean, that's been the case. You know, I referenced Attorney General Holder. He was hiding fast and furious documents. Remember the gun running the Obama gang was engaged in to try to undermine our Second Amendment rights by pretending that America was at the fault for cartel gun violence, when in fact it was the Obama administration that was causing cartel gun violence by allowing the cartels to get guns directly without interference, actually allowing it to happen and traffic. You had the, essentially Obama's people allowing guns to be trafficked to the cartels and they saw it was happening and they could have stopped it and they didn't. fast and furious, but we had gotten a lot of those documents that Congress had sued and found Holder in contempt for before <laughs> Congress got them in the end. You know, and to be clear, you know, we've looked pretty carefully at these executive privilege issues. As I said, we've been doing this for years and years and years, 30 years. We've got unique experience. So we generally know what executive privilege means. And I've looked at the letter, I've looked at the background, and what it looks like to me is they're just making it up. Executive privilege typically means uh, communications that a president, um, it's executive privilege or communications usually relates to a president seeking or obtaining advice. So if the president calls up someone in his administration or even outside the administration, I think executive privilege applies to private advisors as well, that communication and what advice he gets typically is protected by executive privilege. And what the government is trying to do here, the Biden regime is trying to do here, is they're trying to put in a bunch of apply FOIA exemptions to Congress, which is inappropriate. Like, for instance, they can withhold material from us under FOIA. Well, you can't do that necessarily to a congressional subpoena. So they're trying to paint these FOIA exemptions under with this veneer of executive privilege. It doesn't apply. But what, what's the privilege of a, of, of a president being interviewed by a special counsel in a criminal investigation? They're saying it would chill further Re, you know, further in additional investigations of people being unwilling to cooperate. Are they suggesting a, 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 another president won't cooperate in a criminal investigation because an audio of the interview would get out? Come on. So it's obviously purely political. 
and they're using the law, misusing the law, misusing the constitutional privileges the president does have to try to protect Joe Biden politically and obviously his administration for more embarrassment by providing cover to Garland by asserting executive privilege as a way to protect him from being held accountable in court because the thinking is, well, if he's not cooperating with the subpoena in response to an executive privilege claim, there's no way he can be prosecuted. So what, is, what a scheme this is, isn't it? And this is why Judicial Watch's independent lawsuits are so important because FOIA is what it is and they have to make FOIA exemption claims. Now, are they going to bring the executive privilege case, the executive privilege issue into our FOIA case? I'd like to see how that's going to work. It's going to be difficult for them, I would submit. And the hypocrisy of it as they destroy President Trump's executive privilege prerogatives that he maintained as a former president, raided his home, and they're pretending privacy protects Joe Biden from basic government transparency law and the Justice Department from being held accountable for how it fairly applies the law. Remember, the scandal of Joe Biden is he actually committed the crimes that they're prosecuting Trump on. Literally the same category of crimes, but unlike Trump, Biden had no legal basis to have the documents, certainly as a senator. And even under the Biden administration's interpretation of the law, he had no reason to have the documents at all as vice president. Yet he isn't being prosecuted because his memory is bad. Who are they fooling? No wonder they don't want this audio to be released. And if it said memory is so bad, he doesn't deserve prosecution, then frankly, we should be talking about the 25th Amendment. And if Garland thinks that his memory's fine, then why isn't he prosecuting Biden and rejecting her conclusion that Biden shouldn't be prosecuted? He can't have his cake and eat it too. I guess you can if you're a left winger whose chief goal, it seems, as attorney general is to destroy our constitution by jailing his political opponents and promoting the destruction of our republic. So Judicial Watch will continue to do our own heavy lifting in court. I don't know what Congress is going to do. It's never going to be enough, I guarantee you. It's progress that there's going to be some accountability for Garland in the form of contempt. But in the end, we want that audio, right? And so we're in a position to try to get it as quickly as can be gotten, given the Biden administration's obstruction. So pray for wisdom and discernment of the courts here in Washington, D.C. for a change, and that the rule of law prevails and we're able to get this information for you, the American people. All right. Well, you know, it's, some, it's a long ball game, right? And since 2020, Judicial Watch has been the leader in getting out key information about the origins potentially of COVID and the controversial activities that the U.S. government was funding at the Wuhan Institute of Virology and elsewhere in China, namely gain of function research, the type of research that, if indeed COVID was an engineered virus, that would have been the basis for engineering it, gain of function. That's why there's been this outrage about the funding. And they tried to hide the documents, they tried to hide their knowledge of the gain of function research, and Judicial Watch was the first to get the core information out through our FOIA litigation about gain of function research. In fact, most recently in April of last year, we showed how the, Biden, the uh, Fauci gang knew that they were calling it mutant, they were using coronaviruses, uh, gain of function on coronaviruses to create mutants. They literally called it mutants. Now, I don't know about you, it never occurred to me to call the coronaviruses that were subject to gain of function research mutant viruses. But that's what the gain of, that's what EcoHealth Alliance, who was running these operations in China with the Wuhan Institute and elsewhere, 
That's what they called it in government materials. Fauci was funding the creation of mutant coronaviruses, and we're all supposed to ignore the likelihood that I think is pretty darn strong, but not confirmed, that that type of activity led to the creation of COVID or COVID-19. And I've long suggested that it was improper what was going on. They pretended it was a gain of function, but yet they all knew it and it shouldn't have been funded under their own rules. And you know who agrees with me? The Biden administration. Because HHS just announced, it was uh, uh, released through Congress, that they are shutting down funding for EcoHealth. And this was the release from earlier this week. Today, Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic Chairman Brad Wenstrup issued the following statement. Uh, uh, after the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services accepted the select subcommittee's recommendation to formally to debar, debar. You know what debar means? It means they can't get, a, get money again. EcoHealth Alliance, HHS will immediately commence official debarment proceedings and implement a government-wide suspension of U.S. taxpayer funds to EcoHealth, including a hold on all active grants. That's just great news. And let me be clear, obviously it, the, the public safe, the public, the, the accountability and the vindication for those of us who have been calling for just this type of measure, fa it's a big failure that Congress hasn't shut all of this down. But let me just say this, thank God for the public safety because this is so dangerous what was going on, this gain of function research. And if you think it's limited to coronavirus, I tell you, it's going on all over the world, it's going on here in the United States, but obviously a place like China where there are these competing issues, to put it charitably, bioweapons, gain of function, do I need to put two and two together for you? What an important development. And it's an admission it was gain of function. That's why they shut it down. Here's the cover letter HHS sent to EcoHealth, Dr. Peter Zazek. And they reference, bring up that cover letter if you have it. And they reference all of these grant documents. And all these grant documents were first disclosed to the American people via Judicial Watch. It's kind of, well, I mean, you can see there. Well, this is, this is the re referendum. This isn't what I was referencing. It was the cover letter. But it's the same principle. You see the doc, you, well, you can see some of the documents that they relied on in the memorandum justifying the letter. Now, now Ego Health Alliance can uh, contest this, uh, but it's a major uh, victory for those of us concerned about what's been going on with U.S. funding of dangerous research, biologic research in China. Now let's go back to, oh, there's the letter. Debar and, and so the debarment is generally for a period not to exceed three years. However, regardless of whether EcoHealth Alliance contests this action or responds to this notice, I am, may impose debarment for a longer period or shorter period as the circumstances warrant. So we got to make sure they never get the money again. So right now it's temporary, but it's got to be made permanent in terms of protecting us from this menace. Now let's go to the other thing. Uh, the, the, the other memo I want to show you. I don't know if you can see on 21 there, paragraph 21, can you draw, can you draw into that? On August 3rd, 2021, I'll read it for you. There was a, a grant was submitted Uh, and a report was submitted at more than two years after the report due date. So 
not only do they get the grant, but they don't bother reporting as they're supposed to. And the NIH's review of the year five, when they list the report, let's go back. Go back to, I'm still reading it, paragraph 21. The NIH's review of the year five report determined that an experiment shown in figure 13 of, this report, of the report had possibly yielded a greater than one log increase in viral activity. That's a description of gain of function research. Basically, increased viral activity as a result of human intervention. However, there were no facts to show that they notified the Fauci agency program officer and grants management specialist as required. So those are the, that's kind of an example of the reason they shut all of this down. And of course, Judicial Watch exposed earlier this year, well, it was actually just a month ago, how the FBI was investigating this in 2020, back in March and April of 2020. And they saw it was gain of function, and the gain of function was of such a nature that they wouldn't be able to tell if human beings had actually created the resulting virus. And it took them four years to shut it down. And when, and when Trump tried to shut it down for a little bit, they attacked him. And, you know, and, and when I say Judicial Watch is the lead, I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I mean, we just filed a lawsuit the other day against the, the, the um, who do we sue? HHS, of course we sued HHS over Fauci's deputies' emails. I mean, it looks like to us, he may have been conducting government business on a private account. Dr, uh, that's his name, is David Morans. Morans, excuse me. Uh, we sued in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia after the Fauci agency, I know Fauci's not there anymore, but it's a shorthand way of saying the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at NIH, which is a component of HHS. So think of HHS is up here, and then you have NIH within it, and below within NIH is Fauci's agency. And, and Fauci was a big kahuna there because he had been there for 50 years running that agency as his personal fiefdom. All work-related emails sent and to from NIAID Senior Advisor David Morins on non-governmental email accounts. I mean, how hard is it to figure that out, right? And it looks like the House of Representatives had gotten word that he was sending emails on non-governmental email accounts, and we're following up. Recent whistleblower allegations revealed new additional evidence that Dr. Morins intentionally used his personal email to hide conversations about the origins of COVID-19 and subvert federal transparency laws. Last week, David Morin's self-proclaimed best friend, EcoHealth Alliance President Dr. David Daszak, Peter, Peter Daszak, released four document tranches that confirmed the whistleblower's allegations. Notably, Daszak is at the center of the controversy related to his use of U.S. taxpayer funds to fund dangerous gain-of-function research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And as I say in the release there, <laughs> It's like Hillary all over again, right? I mean, you would think it stopped after Hillary. It hasn't stopped after Hillary. The lawsuit for the hidden emails of a top Fauci advisor echoes the Hillary Clinton email scandal. Then I, I want you to go down a little bit on the, tr on the press release, because I want to show our supporters just how much work we're doing for them on these issues. Let's go. So just look, all of these are different Judicial Watch pieces of litigation and records disclosures. Just the first few. We talked about the FBI document. Emails between the U.S. Surgeon General.
I don't even think I can count off the top of my head how many lawsuits and, and investigations we have going on here. I mean, it's got to be 100 plus FOIAs, if not 200. The number of lawsuits, my guess is nearly 20. You know, they say COVID was the worst thing in the history of the United States, yet they had the worst secrecy to cover it up in the history of the United States. I exaggerate a little bit, but not much. By the way, we've got a great documentary on the COVID censorship. I mean, if we talked gain of function four years ago, they would have taken my video down discussing it. Or at, like twi uh, tw on Twitter, I mentioned, uh, what was it, hydroxychloroquine. I just said it's a safe drug. They took my Twitter account down. What a terrible thing they did to us. And Judicial Watch never stopped. We never stopped suing, investigating, and truth-telling on COVID. Origins, the activities in China, the activities here in the United States, they do that type of gain-of-function research here in the United States, we've exposed it. The vaccine scams, where they told us one thing about the vaccines when they knew another, exposed by Judicial Watch. And we, we were working with our friends, open the books to uncover the monies that Fauci, we're trying to uncover the finances of Fauci. Just incredible work. But we were right, and the Biden, I was gonna say the Obama administration, I guess I'm being redundant. The Biden administration confessed. Oh, before I talk about the alien voting, I, the corruption is so casual across the board, because uh, I was talking about censorship and you know canceling and for saying the wrong thing. Did you see this Kansas City chief uh, speech? Well, Kansas, uh, uh, Kansas City Chief's kicker speech, Harrison, Butker. what's his last name? Butker, Harrison Butker. Butker. So I think I misspelled his I, I misspelled his name on my tweet. So he was he spoke at um, Xavier University and he gave college. what was the college Benedictine College Benedictine <laughs> I'm getting all my Catholic universities and he gave a very traditional conservative speech espousing Christian values and Catholic views nothing extraordinary or you know praised his wife promoted pro life principles. Uh, attacked the radical transgender extremist agenda, straightforward stuff. And of course, the left went crazy, uh, including the NFL. And this is my response to the NFL's attack on him. The woke NFL's anti-Christian attack on Harrison, not Harrick, Butker for espousing his mainstream Catholic views is another example of why I don't watch their product. Although Butker is a good reason to cheer for the Chiefs now, I guess. Maybe I'll start watching the Chiefs. And I don't watch the NFL anymore generally. At least I try to avoid it. Because uh, in 2020, they began their anti-police, anti-military, disrespecting the flag. And to this day, they continue to promote that sort of radical anti-police, uh, anti-American agenda corporately. And it kills me not to watch the NFL. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a Baltimore Ravens guy, so it kills me. The Ravens went, and I couldn't really watch the game, or I didn't watch the game when they were in the playoffs. And lost to the Chiefs, right? So I, I have to admit, I do track the NFL, but I don't watch the game. So I'm not going to pretend to be holier than thou on this. I try, I try. <laughs> But the NFL has a diversity officer who, who, who disavowed his statement. Why? He didn't have to disavow his statement. He just said, he's, a, he's a, an American citizen. He has a full right to say what he said. God bless America. Instead, they said, he's wrong, or essentially said, this is not our view. That's why I call it anti-Christian. And on top of that, some person working for Kansas City, or who, who had access to their Twitter account, kind of smeared him by listing his 
uh, his his town of residence, which you know was an easy way to dox dox someone, which is to provide personal information in a way that places someone at risk. And they had to delete the tweet. Kansas City Mayor apologizes for now deleted Harrison Butker tweet, and the tweet noted where the town he lived in. I guess he lives outside of Kansas City. My guess is I don't. I don't remember what I don't I didn't see what the original tweet said, but my guess is they tried to disavow him by reminding people where he actually lived. Just outrageous abuse of government. And we filed a FOIA request down there in Kansas City. I mean, this is an example of the government abusing their power to target an American citizen over their First Amendment protected speech. And in this case, it's a Christian again who's being abused by the abusers in government who really hate Christian beliefs. They really do. Let's be blunt on it. So I know it's been in the news a lot, and I thought I'd give you, you know, because I see this government misconduct, and this is what I love about Judicial Watch. You know, we see something like this, and we say, well, the government shouldn't be doing that. How did that happen? And we're able to pursue the open records law and get some accountability. And I suspect we will. <sighs> so another big issue that's come up recently is the issue of non-citizen voting. Yes, Virginia, aliens vote in our elections. It's easy for them to vote in federal elections because the law relies on their honor to not vote, meaning they can register to vote, they can say they're a citizen, you're not supposed to, if you do, that's a violation of law, but since we don't verify it, they can do it without fear of really ever being caught. And then once they're registered, it's easy, easy to vote. So technically, none of that's supposed to be happening at the federal level, aliens voting, but the numbers are, studies have shown, and reality shows they do vote in elections. And the more aliens present in the United States, the more illegal aliens present in the United States, it's a numbers game. A certain percentage is going to register and a certain percentage of those people are gonna vote. On top of that, the left opposes any distinctions between citizens and non-citizens. Of course the left wants illegal aliens to vote, non-citizens to vote. Every place they are able to at the local level, they get them to vote in local elections, including here in the District of Columbia, where illegal aliens and uh, resident aliens who are ineligible to vote in federal elections are able to vote. You heard that. Illegal aliens can vote for the mayor of D.C. or the city council or these local ANC commissioners, which are basically these local elected bodies that uh, harass businesses in their, in their neighborhoods <laughs> and private property owners. It's like having, um, what do they call it? Uh, uh, the con when, you, when you move into a condo or a... Uh, yeah, it's like having a home, an HOA with government power. Even more, it's like a, a super-sized HOA, these ANCs. So the Russian ambassador can vote if he wants to. Chinese ambassador can vote. Maybe they can run for mayor. I don't see what, what the prohibition would be. And so we noticed one of our intrepid one of my intrepid colleagues at Judicial Watch noticed they at DC was going to have a special event educating illegal aliens on how to vote. So we asked for and obtained the document. And this is the document that shows they used uh, to educate illegal aliens on how to steal the votes of citizens, legally steal them. Non-citizen voting in the United States. Let's go to the top so I don't get lost behind. D.C. Board of Elections Voter Education and Outreach. Gives the address. Next. Who we are, and it's the independent agency of the D.C. government, nonpartisan, and they run our elections here. Let's go next. Non-citizen voting in D.C., and this is, this is the category of people they can vote for. Non-U.S. citizen residents of the District of Columbia can vote in local elections under the Local Resident Voting Rights Amendment Act of 2022. Non-U.S. citizen residents can vote in the district elections for the offices of mayor, attorney general, chairman or members of the D.C. Council, members of the State Board of Education, 
course, D.C. is in a state, but they want to be a state, so they're, they falsely call their Board of Education a state Board of Education, or advisory neighborhood commissioners. Non-U.S. citizen residents cannot vote for federal offices, so I'm glad they clarified that. Let's go to the next one. And this is all you need, this is the eligibility. It's, a, it's This is the kicker. To register to vote in the District of Columbia as a non-citizen, you must be at least 17 years old and 18 year olds by the next general election, maintain residency in the District of Columbia for at least 30 days prior to the election in which you intend to vote. Now, that's an interesting clause because I read that as like every illegal alien in the country can register the vote as long as they promise intend to show up here for 30 days prior to the election. Maybe I shouldn't have said that because everyone will start registering beyond the people living here currently. Not claim voting residents of the right to vote in any state, territory, or country. I mean, that's no restriction on a, a, an ambassador, right? I mean, he could, he's a resident here under this definition of the law not been found by a court to be legally incompetent to vote. Well, there's that. So there, there, that's, you know, no prohibition on legal aliens voting. You can join a party, God bless America, illegal aliens in a political party. Maybe they can come up with a new political party here in the district, of, like the illegal alien political party, under this logic. Let's go to the next slide. And this is the proof of residence you need to show. So here's a modest restriction on at least establishing residence. But no voter ID, it's just a copy of a current utility bill, which you can get it from anywhere, really. Next. And here is their online program allowing illegal aliens to vote. They've got literally a website to help illegal aliens vote in local DC elections. And let's go to the next one. So these are just some closeout dates related, you know, be sure to, if you're an illegal alien, here are the dates you need to be sure to get your voter registration in. Let's go to the next one. Not relevant here, not too much here. Same day voting. So the illegal aliens can show up on the day of the election and vote. Same day voting is, a, is, is an abomination if you believe in free and fair elections that have any integrity. Next up, oh, this is what I love. They got their official non-citizen voter registration application. So there it is. The U.S. Capitol has turned over control of its government in part to foreign nationals legally and illegally present in our nation's capital. I tell you, our enemies must be looking at an opportunity there. What, what country would allow its foreign capital to be controlled by foreigners? What country would allow its capital to be controlled by foreigners? This capital does. And it's done on, with the sufferance of Congress. Now, Congress tried to overturn this. So under our Constitution, uh, the only reason there's a D.C. council or a mayor is because Congress allows it to take place because under the Constitution, Congress has plenary authority over the District of Columbia. I mean, they can eliminate the D.C. council and the mayor. They can eliminate this law, and they haven't done so yet. Republicans successfully voted to overturn it, and it died in the Senate. So Congress, both Republicans and Democrats, have not made it a priority to ensure the right to vote is restricted to, or <laughs> is restricted to citizens only here in our nation's capital, a place that they are specifically constitutionally res responsible for in terms of its operations and governance. Now I see just before I went on air, the House is, uh, is going to consider a vote next week uh, to uh, restrict 
the vote to citizens only here in Washington, D.C. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And you can be sure that it's largely this vote's taking place thanks to Judicial Watch's disclosures this week highlighting, which, has been, which was well covered online, that illegal aliens are voting here in Washington, D.C. and reminding the public of that. Now, there are other localities where illegal aliens are able to vote. Uh, there is grave concern, and concern, I think, which is justified, that the Biden administration is uh, causing states and others dealing with illegal aliens to offer them the opportunity to register to vote repeatedly. And we're in the midst of investigating that, and that's a major concern. And we talked about last week how there was a, an effort to restrict uh, or put some teeth into the law that prevents uh, aliens from voting in our federal elections by requiring proof of citizenship to vote or to register to vote. And that was opposed, or that's being opposed. Maybe they just introduced the bill. Oh wait, the, the bill that was passed but opposed by the left and all Democrats was a bill that restricted aliens from being counted in the census in a way that would cause uh, the states in which they reside to get the benefit of their presence by having more representatives in Congress and more electoral college votes. The left wants to turn over political power or keep and obtain, obtain and expand political power by having aliens vote and uh, be counted for purposes of apportionment and the distribution of congressional power. We're losing America, quite literally, right in front of our eyes. 10 million people, that's gonna change the course of Congress and its representation if they're counted in the next census in a dramatic fashion. And Judicial Watch is gonna expose it and try to stop it wherever we can wherever we can. And that's what we did here just in the District of Columbia, for example. So a lot going on. Uh, and of course, Judicial Watch has other important election integrity work. And I, it, I would be, it would be uh, remiss of me not to remind you of it. Uh, we've got this major new lawsuit in California we filed to clean up their election rolls there. It looks like there are maybe 2 million names that at least need to clean up. We have a lawsuit in Illinois to clean up their election rolls there. We have lawsuits in Illinois and, Cal and, and Mississippi to ensure that votes are counted on election day. Certainly mail-in ballots that arrive after election day should not be counted. You have an election day, not an election week, not an election month. And of course, we're kind of pursuing this issue related to kind of this core issue of election integrity, right? Which is who gets to vote? And let, you, let me remind you, the other major election integrity issue is exposing and fighting the election interference by the Biden administration and their Democratic Party allies to jail President Trump. That's election interference in your face. It's election rigging that's happening right now. But I digress, and I could talk a long time about that. But you don't need to hear me talk about it. Maybe I'll talk about it next time again, depending on how this trial goes. So uh, be sure to join us here next time on the Judicial Watch Weekly Update. God bless you and God bless America. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and like our video down below.